speaker is uh, Fabio Jules uh, from Harvard. Uh, so we'll hear about the uh, microscopy of the uh, fermion Harvard model. Thanks so much. I would also like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, and I hope when now it's running. So I want to try to talk about a quite similar uh, topic as Matthias did, but from a fully different uh, perspective. So this is really kind of cold atoms, I think, starting to explore interesting physics of the Fermi Hubbard model. Uh, of course, the motivation in the end is to explore the phase diagram of the Fermi Hubbard model. Um, and you know, one question that basically Matthias discussed is, if the, is there any topological order? And I mean, I don't have to talk about this, right? Because the motivation was that actually these Fermi arcs maybe the signature of some uh, topological order, um, in particular for this low-doping pseudo-gap uh, regime over here. And so for me, what this really means is that essentially, uh, if you talk about uh, gauge theories, it means the ingredients you kind of discuss in that regime uh, as the underlying constituents that describe physics are spinons, charge-ons, and then there's, of course, this possibility to have emergent gauge excitations. Uh, which in this case would, you know, would be what uh, saves uh, or reconciles the Slepinger theorem and these Fermi arcs. And um, so, you know, one perspective I think that also Matthias was uh, alluding to is the uh, idea that spinons and chargons may uh, form bound states, and that can be a possible explanation for this uh, pseudo gap phase. So, uh, so we such and the co-workers uh, had a uh, proposal that this may actually explain <coughs> these uh, physics. I don't really want to go into the details here. Uh, rather, the question I want to ask is if you know, this is a possibility uh, that spinons and chargons or holons uh, bind to form some new collective objects, um, what is the microscopic binding mechanism? And so really, also these ingredients like spinons and chargons, the way I want to look at those is really uh, on a very microscopic level. And the idea is, right, that you have these ultra cold atoms now in this uh, optical lattice. These are very clean systems, and that means we can actually do microscopy and look at uh, properties that usually you would think at high energies would, you know, are not even universal, and uh, uh, in actual solids are screwed up anyway. But in these systems, we know the model very well, so we can actually look at these uh, properties. And so this microscopy, where it operates, is you can really look at this diagram. So this is the temporal resolution that you have. This is spatial resolution. Traditional solid state experiments, I would say, work here. So. Argus or, or, or any uh, spectroscopy means they have uh, frequency and momentum resolution, STMS frequency and spatial resolution. But uh, quantum gas microscopes really work here, so they work in the time domain and the spatial domain. Um, and that means you can really take instantaneous snapshots uh, of the actual quantum states you see. And of course, this, this actually means a lot for the type of uh, physics you address, because here you kind of look for the universal uh, low energy regime on long length scales. Whereas these experiments are really designed to look at uh, microscopic things like partons um, uh, and collective bound states like these mediums. And those are really the questions we want to address in this, in this case. Um, of course, this has you know, uh, consequences for the theory you want to kind of put up to describe these experiments. Um, and so here I want to you know, go back to this uh, old question, what happens if you have a single hole and you dope it into some spin environment uh, with antiferromagnetic water? Um, and I want to basically present um, a uh, somewhat different perspective um, that one can take on this, uh, this, uh, on this problem. Um, and so the idea is I want to start with uh, introducing partons. Uh, the simplest way to do that is I simply write the fermion operator uh, as a uh, holon, or in this case I choose a bosonic holon and fermionic spinons. Um, you'll see in the end these statistics don't really matter, and the way of writing it like this of course allows for h field excitations. And now I want to basically ask, uh, well, what happens? So you know, we, let's start from some unloped system. And let's say the ground state, we can write as some good sort of objective green field state of some fermions. And um, then the first thing I want to do is I want to create a spin on holon here. So I basically uh, annihilate one of these fermions from this uh, initial state. And I think of this as a t really tightly bound uh, a pair of a spin on and a holon sitting on the same side. Um, and next I assume, well, you know, I want to look at the strong coupling when the tunneling is much bigger than the spin exchange. And I want to allow uh, these, uh, well, you know, the dynamics to, to start. And look at which part, you know, the Hiller space, what are the important uh, states that I should include to accurately describe uh, how the spin on and the whole on um, interact with each other. Um, and then the idea is, because T is the dominant energy scale, the idea is to apply a bunch of hopping operations where the whole moves around messes up the spin environment, 
And then I basically write down a bunch of states, and they are labeled by uh, J, that's the original position of the spinner Coulomb pair, um, the spin sigma of this spinner, um, as well as the string. And the string is basically just telling me where I go. And then I, what I do is I apply the string operator to sigma, and all it does is really it moves around the spins um, that, that we initially had. Um, okay, that's, you know, that's a way of writing it down. And so in this way, um, by look, going through all these different string configurations, you have a bunch of states. And sure enough, those guys, you know, depending on this uh, unload state, they would not be orthonormal in general. But as long as you have strong enough local antiferromagnetic correlations, this you can think of this as a, a reasonable... Uh, approximate uh, orthonormal basis. And that's what I'm going to do. I'll just postulate these guys are approximately orthonormal states. And then I want to work in this uh, low energy Hilbert space. And one thing I want to remind you that's also important for looking at this experiment later on is um, really this is the, what I, the way I think about this is as a change of geometry, right? Because um, these low energy states, these string states, they all, what, all we do is we really move around the spins in the background, no matter what their state is, we just change the position of the spins. To make that clear, imagine this hole was initially here, uh, and we look at this spin. So it's labeled by side 2, 4, so that's where it originally was. It was at side x equals to y equals 4. And then the string moves along, uh, let's say here, and you can see this spin, which is still labeled by this original side 2, 4, is actually located at side 3, 4. And so basically these uh, low energy states uh, that I uh, construct to solve this problem, um, you can actually think of them as states with a fluctuating lattice geometry, where the relation between the labels of these background spins and the actual position of lattice uh, changes. Okay, and then we do some uh, calculation in this approximate Hilbert space, so we solve the beta lattice hopping problem of basically solve these fluctuating strings. Um, what's also important is we don't allow these background spins to adjust to the presence of the holes, um, but by moving them around, of course, that costs energy, right? Because these guys used to be next to each other and happy, and now we move them around, so that makes them unhappy. And to a simple approximation, you basically get that the potential energy is proportional to the length of the string uh, that we draw. And the string tension, the prefactor here, is basically determined by these uh, correlators C in the background in the unloped, original unloped system. And so these guys we know exactly if we know the unloped system, right? So this is input that we know how to calculate very efficiently. Okay. And so that means, you know, we get an effective wave function. It looks like this. It describes this mesonic bound state of the spinon and the holon. Um, and um, so the first part is basically this fluctuating um, string state. So we, the, the wave function you can really think of as a superposition uh, of different uh, strings, different lattice configurations um, of the surrounding spins. We can also go one step further and also describe basically the other end of the string, describe the uh, uh, wave function of the spinon. I'm not going to do this here, but that's something we, we did, and, and uh, it's actually important to understand the dispersion relation of this uh, meson to the end. Um, and in principle, there's also this, uh, I call this squeeze space, so that's the wave function describing the <coughs> original background spins. In principle, there should be a back action, right? When there's a hole, these spins in the background should adjust. Um, the assumption here is that we can treat that perturbatively, and we don't really think it has a big effect, so for now, uh, I ignore it. And, Ignoring these, or basically assuming this is the original unknown state, I call this frozen spin approximation. We kind of freeze the background spins, just move the holes around, and see what happens. Okay, so you know you do these calculations, and then what you get is um, um, a, a histogram of how likely is it to get certain string lengths. Now you can see that, uh, of course, depends a lot on the ratio of the tunneling to the super exchange j. If t is small, you get a kind of a peak distribution. If it gets larger, you get a wider distribution. And this, of course, is something in these quantum gas microscope experiments that, uh, at least in principle, they can tune very well. You know, so uh, t equal 1 to j or 3j, that's totally within the range of parameters they can uh, easily uh, access in the experiments. Okay. Um, you can also put this in a more um, uh, you know, quantitative trial weight function where we don't have to make any assumptions about these base states being orthonormal. That was something I put in my hand. Um, and um, I don't want to go into details, but basically this is a way of also getting momentum and the uh, properties of these spaces. Okay, so now uh, the question is, can we see any signatures in, let's say, experiments, or at least in numerics, um, of these, uh, I call these geometric strings, right, these, these hidden string states. Um, and so one thing you realize is the whole idea of this wave function is to say that you have a superposition of different string configurations, meaning of different lengths of strings, but also of different orientations of these strings. And 
Then, of course, what you realize is by averaging over basically all these different configurations, the averaging of these quantum fluctuations, um, you should expect liquid-like correlations, right? Because, you know, the orientation sometimes like this, sometimes that way. Mm, but that means, you know, if you want to see these strings, you should actually look at the individual snapshots. And the nice thing is that that's really something these article uh, atom experiments can do. And we want to explore if there's a way we can actually see these strings. But the holes are delocalized. They're running around. How do you, how right. do you see this picture? Right. In this picture, the idea is right that these uh, screen ons at the end of the string, they, they are delocalized. And the holes just follow. And so, uh, for instance, in this, OK, I didn't really talk about this, but in this wave function here, you, you basically take an initial state, you create a spin on at J spin on, and then you have a superposition of all the spin on. Yeah, but I'm saying in practice, the holes are running around. So, uh -huh. how do you take a step? How do you take uh -huh. a snapshot? And right. So, experiment? I see. So, you know, they basically it's, they literally do a quantum projective measurement. So they have the lattice. They suddenly freeze the lattice it's super, super deep on time scales which are way faster than any tunneling time. And then they shine the light on the on the system, and they can see the instantaneous uh, configuration. Uh, right. And that's something totally non trivial in solids, but at least algebraic atom people. <coughs> Um, all right, so now um, one thing we did is we did DMRG simulations. And so it's a single hole on an 8x8 eight eight torus. In principle, you know, these DMRG simulations are also have been done previously. What we do, though, is we basically sample snapshots in the fog phases. So we kind of simulate what these quantum gas microscope uh, experiments would do. And then the first thing we do is we basically, so we take snapshot and we determine the sites that deviate from the perfect checkerboard needed measure. And so the red sites, they, those are the sites that deviate from the immediate pattern. And then we see the hole is, let's say, here, the black uh, side. And then we say, oh, actually, this looks like a string going out of this, uh, out of this hole. And then we just take the length of the string, um, and we look at the distribution function of these lengths. OK, and we should actually start with the length, uh, sorry, with tan length t equal to 0. This is a totally localized hole, and that should be you know, just stuck there in this more or less nice antiferromagnet. Um, and then you can see that indeed most of the strings have a length zero, and some, you know, though there's also some noise, and this is just one of the fluctuations, right? Because you actually take a snapshot. Um, you can see there's this uh, sawtooth picture that's easy to understand from just considering spin exchanges, which change the length uh, by two. Um, okay. But of course, the more interesting question is what happens if these folds actually move, uh, start to move around? Okay, so um, to answer this question, let's first see what this geometric string picture um, suggests that I you know, started to explain in the beginning. And so what we do now is we take the same snapshots at tunneling zero. So those are kind of, um, you know, here the doping is not really important. The hole is there, but it's, it's stuck, so it doesn't do much. And then we move the hole around by hand and mess up the spin environment in these snapshots. So we kind of modify these snapshots by hand. And then we get these curves. So this is, um, you know, tunneling 0.9j, 3j, so that, you know, the red and the blue. You can see immediately the, the background changes a lot, and also the tunneling t over j ratio has a, has a uh, an important effect on this. Um, um, okay. And then you compare this prediction to full actual DMRG simulations. And so those are these error bars here, right? And so this is now the honest DMRG simulation, and you can see it's actually fairly close. It's almost perfect, right? And this is totally without any fit parameters or anything. And what I think what this tells us is that um, there's, this is a signature that there's some short range hidden string order in the system uh, that we directly see here. Um, and you know, quite amazingly, we don't need any fit parameters to predict how it looks like. And that means we kind of understand very well on a microscopic level how these uh, correlations between the charge and spins look like. Okay. Yes, sorry. Can you compare the ando system with the DMRG? You right, because you're taking some kind of RVB andas for the ando system. Well, so these simulations are DMRG, so this is totally um, unbiased, right? No, but even like without the hole, what? Uh -huh. your, your, your answers, what kind of what yeah. kind of are you putting in for the ah, signals? Yeah, actually, so the, to get the, the best predictions we get, we, we actually take a band insulator, so we do break the SU2 symmetry by hand. But so, you know, I, don't, I can put anything in there and basically make a prediction how doping, <coughs> or what the effect of doping is in any spin uh, system. And, you know, in some cases, the theory may work better, in some less, less well. Um, but the only ingredient I need in this calculation is, is these background spin correlations, because those determine the string tension. And, you know, also in this comparison here, right, when I basically put these guys in by hand, the only thing I need is this, the string length histogram. And, you know, I calculated from the background spin correlators that I know from Monte Carlo and the Gandalf system. 
So okay. here you're putting a spin on pen structure that actually with long range anti-promagnetic order. Is yes, that that's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay, so now, um, as I, you know, I, I said that if we average or with different snapshots, we should see liquid-like correlations. So this is basically looking at um, these correlations. So imagine there's a hole here, there's a certain distance x, y, you look at the local correlators, and indeed you can see that as much of distance, the correlations that you get by averaging over all these configurations goes to a constant, so it looks like a liquid. Okay. Um, so I'm showing this because now, you know, we want to actually look at experiments. And so the first uh, set of experiments uh, I want to show us actually from the group of Imari Blocks here. And they basically measured exactly how the spin environment looks like around a single uh, dopamine. In this case, they have Dublon, but it behaves like cold. And you know, they, they get a map like this. So they basically have this Dublon moving around in a harmonic track. Uh, and then they see how these uh, the diagonal spin correlations look like in the vicinity of this Dublon. Um, and so this is a plot, it's a function of distance, the spin correlators. The blue is the experiment. You can see it actually close to the um, to the dopant, we can see a negative and a, uh, uh, you know, a strong modification, and then it kind of goes back, so that's the stick with like behavior we would expect. This geometric string approach here also at least gives the same qualitative behavior. And the most interesting part of course is that it's locally directly around this dopant, we see an, a sign change. So these, instead of being ferromagnetically aligned, as you would think of the undoped systems, these guys are actually anti ferromagnetic in this string picture, this has a very simple explanation. So imagine you don't, first there's no string. String, I just create a hole here, and I look at these two spins. Okay, first they're anti, uh, sorry, these are nearest neighbors, so they're anti-aligned. Now I create the string, I move this guy around, and this actually now, after taking the snapshot here, now actually counts as a diagonal correlator. But they used to be anti-aligned, so you kind of mess up, you mix up nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor correlators, and that's a way of creating the sign change. Okay, now you might wonder, well, you know, this is a single dopant, very low doping. What, what is actually happening if we have a finite doping system? Um, and so these are experiments now in Marcus Kleiner's group. And they look at the full doping. Dependence. So they kind of have a somewhat cleaner system. They have this nice bucket. You can see this is an actual snapshot. This is a mod insulator that they see in the system. They look at the doping dependence of, in this case here, the diagonal correlator. And they can see it goes down. And you can also see it actually goes negative around, I don't know, 18, 15% doping. And so, you know, our picture is that this, the fact that this was negative is the same uh, reason as before, except this is a, like, this is a global quantity, but there's so many strings that you, you so massively messed up your system that it actually goes negative. Uh, in fact, we did theory comparison. So the first line here, the dotted line, what we do very much in the spirit from before, we take the snapshots at half fitting. So we just take these experimental snapshots and put them holes by hand, right? And so this is asking, well, the, the, the bare presence of holes, does it change these correlators? Well, it does change them, but not by far not enough to explain you know, this, this strong dependency. Um, this solid line here, this you know, gray solid or, uh, line, that's the string theory. So we also create these holes, but we move them around to mess up the spin environment. And you can see, actually, without any fit parameters, we get pretty decent agreement with the experiment. Um, also, you know, the PyFlex RBB theory is also a reasonable agreement. Um, it's, it's not negative, but you know, maybe you know, one can certainly work on this theory, maybe that um, also uh, gives some improvement. Um, so we can also look at other things that, you know, less uh, usual than, than just correlators. Here we look at the number of string counts, so we take snapshots, determine these string patterns. Um, there's an offset because in this case they don't have full resolution, they don't see the, uh, where exactly the holes are. And you can see, as a function of doping, the string count goes up, and it kind of saturates around 15 or so percent doping. And again, the, the, this count is very well described by, this, uh, by just putting in these strings by hand. Um, okay, finally, um, this kind of raises the question, which one is the better description? Is there this short range hidden order, the string picture? Is that a more accurate uh, theory for the, what we see? Or is it high flux or some other RBD state? And one way to answer this is to do machine learning. And so this is the first chart. We took at this, so we took a neural network, trained the data with, uh, well, our hidden order string stuff, and also uh, PyFlux RBB theory. And then we just asked, where does, where does the experimental data go that they take in Marcus Kleiner's group? And you can see, actually, it favors these geometric strings over this PyFlux data that we described. Um, so you know, this kind of shows you the power of these cold atom experiments that they have in the future. <coughs> Um, I'm kind of looking forward to that, and uh, on that note, I want to uh, close. Thank my collaborators, and thank you very much. So there were already questions during the talk. I think it's a good time for a break. And, uh,
feel free to ask one question. Okay. And let's thank all the speakers in this session.